Our scripture reading comes to us from the first letter of John, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Hear now the word of the Lord. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning, uh, we are beginning uh, during the month of September uh, to work through the first letter of John. The letters of John get the least airtime of just about any book in the Bible. Everybody loves Revelation, but we miss John. And one of the things to understand is if we want to unlock the Revelation, we have to understand the letters of John. If we want to understand the letters of John, we need to understand the Gospel of John. If we really want to understand the Gospel of John, then we better be really versed in Genesis and the prophets, because it's all right there. John is not one of the synoptic Gospels. Synoptic, the Greek meaning similar. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic Gospels, because in the Gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you get a similar telling. Some of them record things a little different, and they emphasize different parts, and they're different links. But in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see the same things occurring at the same time. Not so much with John's writings. John writes to a church that is being established, a church that has heard the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, a, a church that is well, it's in a big transition point. By the time John is writing these epistles, what's happening is the first generation of apostles, those apostles like John and Matthew and Luke and Peter and James and Paul, they're beginning to transition. They're beginning to transition because they're being killed or they're dying. I guess that's the same thing, but one's a little bit more pointed than the other one. And the second generation is beginning to come up, like Timothy, Titus, Junia, Priscilla, some of these other folks. And as this transition is going on, sometimes when we look at history, we think of, okay, well, here is when this happened, and this ended, and then this other thing began. But that's not the way history works, is it? There's always periods of flux and transition, and that's what's happening. There are this, this, this giving and taking of, of what's going on because the church is still emerging, but it's a little bit more than what it was when it first started. Persecutions are in full swing. The church has the attention of all the political authorities. As John is writing this, he's going to mention about uh, uh, later on in, in his uh, and what we have is his first letter about a, a warning to stand against false teaching. And we know this has got to be a big deal because in the book of Acts, it's uh, standing against false teaching is referenced. In Paul's letters of Romans, Colossians, Titus, and Timothy, there are references to, to be careful with false teaching. Second Peter addresses false teaching, and of course, First John does as well. Well, why is this important? Well, because if you just read verses 5 through 10, it doesn't, I mean, it's beautiful, but it kind of leaves you scratching your head. Because he starts off by saying, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And then by the end of it, in just five verses, he is then flipped to saying, now y'all remember, we're all sinful. If you say you don't have sin, you are a liar, and you don't understand, and you don't have fellowship with God, and you don't have fellowship with each other. Because if, if, if God is light, and you are walking in the light, then it's going to impact the way we live and think and relate to the world and to those around us. And that's the backdrop of what is happening. You see, there's a lot of false teaching that was going on at the time that John is writing this, at the time that Paul is addressing the church in Rome and the church of Colossae and 
uh, giving Titus and Timothy instructions, and when, when Peter is addressing uh, his congregations, there's, there's a lot of this tension that's going on because of, well, you've got these folks that are coming in, and they're saying things that just don't go along with the truth that John and Peter and, and James and, and, and Matthew have witnessed. There's controversies coming up with the Nicolaitans, uh, for example, that, that John calls out in his revelation because Nikolai is a teacher that has come in and has started to teach that Jesus Christ really didn't die on the cross. He just pretended to die. And that, that, that Jesus' death it, it was, was something that just made us take notice. That's not what the Gospels say, and that's not what the apostles first understood. Well, what is it that John is addressing? Well, we're not really sure. He, he doesn't ever specifically just start naming issues of what's going on here in, in, in his letter. But there is some ideas. And believe it or not, at least one of the ideas that John wants us to understand about who Christ is and who God is is an idea that is still prevalent in our world today. And I'm being a little trepidatious because I guarantee you I'm about to say something that some of y'all have said, and if you haven't said it, I guarantee you everybody's heard it. Have you ever been going through a difficult time, whether it be something going on at work, something that takes us unaware at home, or especially around situations where we've lost a loved one, and someone has looked at you and said, well, everything happens for a reason. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. Now, it's meant to offer comfort, right? It's meant as a way of holding on and saying, I don't understand why in the world this is happening, but I know God holds all things, and God is going to make something come from this. Well, my question is, why don't we say that instead? Why don't we say that no matter what the circumstance or no matter what the situation, we know that God is with us, that God loves us, that God holds us, and that God can redeem anything? You cannot mess up so bad that God cannot redeem you. And there is not a situation ever that God cannot make a blessing come from. Well, then what's the problem with saying, well, everything happens for a reason? Well, I'm glad you asked, because that's what John's talking about. When we say that everything happens for a reason, we are taking no responsibility for the choices that we make. We are taking no account that the world, as recorded in Genesis chapter 3, has fallen in sin and that things are not the way that God intends them to be. And what we are doing is we are saying that every single thing that happens, happens because God commands it. Well, now there's a difference between recognizing that God allows something and God causes something. And when we say everything happens for a reason, then we say that God is responsible for every good and perfect gift for every blessing, for every means of grace, which we hold that to be true, don't we? But when we say that, we also say that God is the cause of every pain, every suffering, every evil, every sin. Because if everything happens for a divine reason, then it must be because God commands it. And John, in the first letter that we have that he wrote, is absolutely jumping up on that and stomping it out. He's saying, no, there is an attribute of God that we have to understand, that God is light, and in God there is no darkness. Now, light is one of the, 
biggest illustrations throughout Scripture to, to, to illustrate God's divine presence. Since the reason why we light candles on the altar on Sunday morning. It's not just to help in case the power goes out. we still got a little light. It's right there because it represents God's divine presence as the acolyte brings in the, the fire to the altar. And the cross bearer comes in and is a, a, a visual understanding that the Holy Spirit of God is filling this place and that God is with us as we worship. And at the end of the service, when the acolyte and the crossbearer carry fire back out, it's that God is in the world and that we are going in the world to join where God is at work. And it's a beautiful reminder, the two candles on the altar, the gospel candle and the epistle candle, the gospel candle, the message of the church, the epistle candle, the work of the church. And if you notice, it's light that we use. John loved the illustration of light. Doubt what I'm saying? Go check out his gospel, very first chapter. Notice how many times he uses light. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Everything came into being through him. Without him, not one thing that is coming to being came into existence. He is the light of the world. and The darkness can't overcome it. John wants us to understand that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. There is no shadow. There is no deceit. There is not a God that sets us up just to knock us down. And that we have to recognize, and that we have to understand, that if we walk in the light of God, that that light is going to shine into all the different places of our lives, including the spots of our lives that we want to hide. You know that the, everybody's got a junk drawer in their house. You don't even establish a junk drawer, it just happens. We just moved into the house back in July, we've already got a junk drawer. We had a junk drawer unpacked before we had any other drawer unpacked. And in that junk drawer you can find so much random stuff that makes no sense being together. Everything from batteries to glue to scissors, zip ties, a, a, a couple of extra buttons, keys, keys to things that we don't own, <laughs> keys that don't fit any lock at the house. But by God, we're keeping the keys because as soon as I throw one away, I'll discover what it is that it goes to. Well, the same thing's true in our lives. We've got junk drawers in our lives where we like to hide the stuff that we know shouldn't be there and we don't want anybody else to know about it. The mistakes that we made and the hurts that we caused, the issues that we've had. And we squirrel that away. And John says, uh uh. Because the light of God even reaches there. And you can't go around acting like we're holier than thou and better than anybody else, and we can't go around acting like anybody else's sin is any better or any worse than ours because all sin is equal before God, and everyone has sinned, and if you say that you don't, you are a liar. Calls it straight out. But if we confess our sin, then we have fellowship with God. And we have fellowship with, with each other, and the blood of Christ cleanses everything. You see, one of the things that's funny is that folks will say, well, in the world today, or in our nation today, or in our state today, no one wants to listen to the church. You're right, nobody wants to listen to the church. Because we like to act like we've got it all together. Instead of being what God intended us to be, we are not a museum for the saints. We are a triage unit for the hurting. We are where broken people come to find restoration and hope. We are where the unloved comes to learn they are loved. I've told Stanley I don't know how many times the way we're going to know how successful our children's ministry has been is not how many children go through confirmation and end up being in youth. It's how many children look at us that God has blessed us with from the cradle until that time in sixth grade. And when I ask them, when did you first hear the name of Jesus Christ? When they say, you know what, I don't know, I've always heard the name of Jesus Christ. 
And when I ask them, when did you first know that God loves you? And they say, I don't know. I've always heard that God loves me. I've told JT how we're going to know if we've had a successful youth ministry is not by how many youth show up on Wednesday nights or Sunday nights. It's by how many 19 and 25 and 35-year-olds continue to grow in their faith and not abandon it the moment that they walk out of, out of, out of our, our doors. You see, how we're going to know if we're a successful congregation is not how many rear ends we have in the pews on Sunday morning or how big our budget can get. I know, we're starting a capital campaign. Bad time to preach this sermon, but here it is. The way we're going to know if we are a successful congregation, how many folks who do not know Christ know Christ because of the work that we are called to do? How many people who are hungry are fed? How many people who are wayward are brought back into a life that not only brings honor and glory to God, but that is lived for, with their benefit is in God's blessings? How many brokenness, how much brokenness is restored? You see, that's the thing. When we, have, when we walk in the light and in the truth of who we are, we find fellowship one with another because no longer are we trying to hide all this stuff in the junk drawers of our lives, but rather we're sharing it. Because I guarantee you, someone else has been where you are. Somebody else knows what it's like to be broken. Somebody else knows what it's like to be praying over a wayward child. Somebody else knows what it's like for a relationship to fall apart. Somebody else knows what it's like to be going through a transition in life where what we used to could do, we can't quite do anymore. Somebody knows what it's like to have made that mistake and experienced that hurt and somebody else is on the other side of it because of the grace of God. And when we have fellowship one with another, I can't help but believe that that's part of the call to care for one another and carry each other's burdens as we learn to cast all of our burdens upon Jesus Christ. You see, God is light. In God, there is no darkness, there is no shadow, there is no sin, there is no pain. Does God allow us to be tested? Absolutely. Does God allow for the ways of the world and the sinful condition that it's in to continue? Yes. We've got a divine promise that's not the way it's always going to be, though. We have a divine promise that the kingdom of God has broken in, but it's not in the fullness that it will be quite yet. Not like it will be when Christ returns. And in the meantime, God allows us free will. We choose whether or not we're going to respond to God's offer of grace. We choose what we're going to do this day. We choose how we're going to live, how we're going to love, the words we say, the actions we do, the attitudes we have, the places that we go. Have you ever noticed in the Lord's Prayer, we ask God not to lead us into temptation? As a nice way of saying, Hey, God, throw a couple of barriers up when I start to try to go down the wrong way. Because I believe, like Frederick, like Frederick Buckner, that the true wrath of God is that God holds us in the palm of His hand, but that God will let us go if we so choose, continuing to call out after us, to run after us, to want to hold us, to, to speak to us, to yearn for us proveniently. We have that choice. So if we want to keep the phrase, everything happens for a reason, I have figured out a way to where some of you don't get completely angry with me because I've told you you can't say that anymore. You can say it, but you've got to add a couple of lines to it, okay? So we can say everything happens for, the reason, for a reason. Sometimes that reason is a gift of grace from God. Sometimes that reason is because there is sin in the world. And sometimes that reason is because we're dumb sometimes and we can make dumb choices. But no matter what the reason is for whatever it is that has occurred, we have a God 
who seeks, who saves, who loves, who redeems. We have a God who makes all things new. We have a God who John teaches us the very first thing we need to understand about the God that we serve is we have a God who is light. And in him, there is no darkness. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hello, my name is Kevin Payne, and I'm the senior pastor here at Bluff Park United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining with us in our podcast of our worship celebration, the sermon this past week. I pray that you found it a blessing and that it enriched your life. If you are ever in our area and would like to join with us in person, we are located at 733 Valley Street here in Hoover, Alabama. Our service time is 10 a.m. and we would love to meet you. I pray you have a blessed week and hope to see you soon. Bye now.